Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Glam. I'm from uh, Techman. So today I will talk about this uh, uh, the analog e-memory computing for the AI. So you know uh, our brain is analog computing. So it only takes like uh, 25 to 50 watts. So our work is really inspired by this uh, uh, brain structure. You know, using the analog computing. Um, hopefully you can enjoy this talk. I think probably everyone is uh, uh, very familiar with this uh, the AI and the AI chip market. It will bring the tremendously, uh, you know, this uh, GDP revenue uh, and the growth in the next two decades. And because of that, the AI chip market also grew at the tremendously speed. So basically, it's like a 30 percent, uh, you know, um, growth rate. This is uh, tremendously. So recently, the Sora for the OpenAI basically generated a lot of the interest, in, um, also from the public. But at the other side, it gives like a lot of the demanding for the AI computing. Uh, just take like a one minute, uh, this is like an AIGC using the Sora. So it takes like a, almost like an hour to generate that. So imagine today, you know, we watch the, all these uh, short videos from TikTok. You know, daily have like a 800 um, million people watch that for two hours. Imagine if this kind of the um, contents is wholly generated by AI. You know, for analysis, that they basically, we need like 80 million uh, additional 800 uh, GPU to generate this kind of video. So that would be tremendously a lot of the computing and also power. I think this is a, probably a lot of people already see these slides uh, from Lisa Su in the last year, the ICC, uh, the plenary keynote talk. So you can see now we are kind of like along this trend. In the next few years, uh, if we don't do anything, you know, in the very soon, we basically need like a, a 500 megawatts just for one data center. You know, a nuclear plant is only can generate like gigawatts. So that means uh, each of the the data center, we need like a dedicated nuclear plant. That is almost uh, impossible. So that's why something heavy taken, you know, to take care of this kind of the, uh, energy efficiency, given such a, like a high uh, demand. That's why you know people start to talk about the so-called in-memory computing. Unlike the traditional the volume and digital system, which is uh, you know separate this like a AIO processor with the memory, it has served us in the past like almost like a few decades. So that is serves us really well through the CPU, GPU, and the ASIC. It works well. But now the problem is, because we separate this kind of the uh, memory and the processor, we have very limited uh, on-chip uh, memory, which is SRAM. But we know SRAM is uh, made with like a six transistor, just to represent a zero or one. That takes a lot of the uh, silicon real estate. Because of that, uh, the SRAM is uh, very limited uh, you know, for the on-chip usage. For the CPU-wise, we have, uh, we talk about like, kilobytes, megabytes. But even the GPU, like uh, 800, you only have like uh, 400 megabytes. The only, you know, the SRAM can go like uh, go by um, gigabytes is by the wafer scan engine, you know, made by Cerebus. But uh, the wafer scan engine, you know, tree has uh, 44 gigabytes. So the SRAM is extremely uh, expensive. But, uh, you know, because of that, we have to use the DRAM. But once we use DRAM, we, we face a lot of this uh, the, uh, data transfer and associated uh, cost. Because uh, the, any shift from the on-chip SRAM to the DRAM, we talk about uh, from the picojoule to the nanojoule, and also from picosecond to nanosecond. Even we're using the HBM, but it's still taking like, a tremendously energy and time. So that's why even in the 1960s, you know, people start to talk about the in-memory computing architecture. This is like a non-volume architecture. It utilizes you know, this memory cell, not only used for the uh, memory storage, but also we can utilize it itself you know, for this computing through the uh, physical law. So basically, because uh, we are, you know, minimize all this kind of movement between the process and the data, and also using the cross by error structure, we limit a lot of the intermediate, gen uh, intermediate data generation as well. So that gives us a very low power consumption. At the same time, you know, compared to the CPU, GPU, which is, has a very limited cost, this in-memory computing using the cross by error structure have a massive uh, parallel computing center. That gives us also the high throughput at the same time. And the last but not least, now the computation is done through the uh, physical law. Basically, we utilize this, the Ohm's law and the current law. That gives us a, a very low latency because we only need like a, almost like one-tenth of the clock cycle to give one step of this uh, VM uh, generation. So because of that, uh, you know, this architecture has a lot of tremendous advantage. But the key is like, you know, to enable this uh, in-memory computing, we do need a special memory device, which is you know, used as memory, but also has a capability to do the competition. That's why even back to uh, 2013, our co-founder, Joshua Yang, so he already gave a, kind of like a very good uh, summarize you know, between what is the difference and the need uh, for the computing and the memory. So uh, you know, 
uh, at one time, on the one side, we kind of release a lot of uh, requirement, for example, the per site cost for this uh, special device. But on the other side, we do need a high, very high level, uh, multi-level. So that is kind of a key. At the same time, you know, we need like a retention of time ratio and so on. So if we use that to apply to all the memory devices uh, we have so far, that it covers you know, volatile from the SRAM, DRAM, now volatile from traditional flash to the emerging devices. Unfortunately, you know, each of the memory uh, takes like decades to develop, and also it has its own usage. But when we apply to this uh, uh, in-memory computing, basically we find them very hard to use. You, you, for example, for the volatile for the DRAM, this is a 1T1C, which is you know, not good for this uh, in-memory computing because the reader will destroy the, um, the, the contents. The SRAM is extremely uh, expensive. We need to take uh, uh, care of this kind of you know, limited size because that you know, we have to take care of the I.O. and so on. Then for the non volatile the no flash has this uh, uh, scaling issue, has the charging issue, especially when we, the retention issue when we use this for the multi-level. The MRAM PC RAM also associated with the other uh, problem. That's why at the you know, we come from very fundamentally from the material and DS level, uh, uh, the device level. First of all, we come with this uh, like the uh, device, which is like a multi-level RM. People are also call a computing member store, you know, tuned for this uh, the uh, competition uh, usage. If you look at the device, uh, you know, we published in the Nature uh, last year. It has all these uh, desired uh, attributes used for the competition. For instance, uh, you know, we achieved 11 bits per cell. This is the highest. Uh, uh, you know, single cell uh, memory density ever made by a human being. And also, the device we developed has a very good retention, you know, very good uh, uh, endurance. It, this is like even the memory grade. And also has a very good uniformity, availability, and the control. And this device uh, not only, you know, uh, suitable for the current uh, uh, dimensions we already uh, developed for the technology node, but also it has a, a huge potential for the future scaling. For instance, uh, we can go like a very small, so because the nature of this uh, conducting filament itself, this uh, like multi-level iron devices in the future, we can go like even sub three nanometer. And also in order to have the memory density, we can go to the 3D stacking as well. So all these results are published in the uh, nature level publication. And this year, uh, our result from the chip also like uh, show, uh, published in the science. From this publication, we basically using the analog computing to kind of like achieve uh, arbitrary you know, high processing as software for a lot of the uh, high performance competition. So this method is like uh, unlike the traditional the bit slicing approach. That is actually you know basically not uh, utilize this uh, analog device uh, uh, advantage, but uh, you know come with uh, this like uh, the, a lot of um, other disadvantage. For this uh, our approach, we use so called uh, true analog you know approach. We basically able to use this uh, uh, analog computing, but uh, just using a few cross binary uh, devices, we use the, uh, a little bit of redundancy. Actually, we can do this uh, uh, very high processing computation. So we demonstrated this one in the several uh, you know, example. Uh, we have the Poisson equation solver. We also use this one to solve like, a, some of the very complicated uh, equation like the MHD uh, problem solve. Basically, that is a very sensitive for each step of the error, but if you can see the result, this is like a matching with the software level procession. And also now the competition interaction cycle can be reduced by just uh, the, uh, our, the mesh size with using the large cross by array, which is you know, for the memory store uh, array we have, because this is like a 1T, 1R per uh, the cell, we can have a lot of the, you know, this kind of cells. And also the, the proposal solution also is more than an order of the magnitude, which is more energy efficient than digital solution, the result as I show here. So basically now we can solve this kind of the, um, even the HPC problem using the analog computing. So in a summarize, you know, uh, this in-memory computing, we are, we are using this, uh, the memory store cell, the multi-level RM, using the conductance or resistance to represent the neural nets. Then we just uh, computation using the, the almost law and the uh, current law. The voltage is coming as the input, you know, we can cross this, uh, uh, the resistor. So basically we can have this like a current once we submachine that, that finish like a one step of this uh, vector matrix uh, multiplication accumulation. Compared to the digital, that is like a much more uh, efficient and also much more shorter time. So at this, you know, Tetraman, we are not only just develop this uh, device, the circuit tree, but also for the software side, we have our own software stack, uh, including the compiler, the SDK, and so on. So basically, we're just uh, using one pre-trained model. We do the quantization, we do optimization. 
and the localization, we can have like millions of the chip uh, deployed using this method. So we don't need like every single die you need to retrain that. So the unique advantage from this is like, uh, this is like, uh, uh, you know, near the zero boson time because this is a non-volatile memory cell. Uh, very low power, basically compared to the um, digital, we have orders of the magnitude of the improvement. And also uh, very low latency because now, you know, using very limited clock cycle, we can achieve this like, uh, uh, you know, one step of the VMM, which is digital cycle take like a thousand clock cycles. So basically for this uh, application, you know, our strategy is like a start with the, the edge inference first. We work with the, uh, the sensor company. We will enable this like the sensor fusion, AI competition at edge. But uh, later, uh, when we enter the more advanced technical node, we will kind of like, you know, try to work with the uh, several potential partner to bring this one to the data center as well as the, for the HPC. The, so the first step, we'll be using the chiplet. So basically this is like an in-memory computing enabled MPU chiplet, which is like a supplementary to the, uh, you know, the, the HPM usage for the data center. So at this moment, uh, we have the Edge chip. If you go to our website, you can see this. Uh, we have the uh, MX100. This is based on the 65 nanometer. But even using the 65 nanometer, we demonstrate that we can achieve like uh, more than 20 tops per watt efficiency. So from there, we have the, you know, the small new network demonstrated. Uh, for example, we have the Amelis. This is just like a toy model, which is for us to debugging all this kind of uh, our SDK component and so on. But also we have like a, the practical usable, uh, the tiny machine learning model. For example, we have this uh, eyeball tracking. So it, uh, you know, this is the model itself is even trained by the Tachima, our company itself. And also we have like a visual workup or person detection. And uh, just last week we bring up the, uh, the keywords uh, recognition. So currently we are working on a 22 nanometer, but uh, if you look at our um, the plan, in the future, we are working on the even like a much more, uh, the more advanced technical node. So basically this year, we are going to start with the 12 nanometer. In the future, we are working with our partner for five nanometer, three nanometer, and so on. So basically from the 12 nanometer onwards, uh, our target for the unchip uh, storage capacity will be like a 7G. And in the future, we envision we can do like a even more than 200 uh, gigabytes at the, you know, in the eight, kind of like eight bits uh, um, storage. So the goal is like we are able to uh, moving toward to more than 300 you know, tops uh, uh, per watt efficiency. Imagine the GPU is running by this efficiency. Instead of running like you know, uh, 500 watts, 700 watts, you only need like a couple uh, watts. So that will be greatly reduce all this uh, footprint of the carbon and all this uh, energy efficient for the data center. At the same time, you know, we develop or uh, continue to work on our um, software. So we are enabled to enable this like, efficient machine learning and the runtime compiler. So our goal is like to enable this like a high performance computing, as well as the you know AIGC for the both edge and the data center in the future. Um, that's all for my presentation. Any question? Thank you so 